Well, good morning, church family. Good morning, online family. I came up here yesterday, and I was just standing here to try to get my get ready. And I thought, you know what? It is so nice to be up here. And it, it's a dream come true, honestly. For 20 years, I've had this dream in my heart to teach and to preach. And I just said, one step at a time, honor the Lord and the dream that he put in me. And I think of Psalm 37.4. It says, delight in the Lord, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. He put that desire in me. And then I followed that, and I said, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to press in. I'm going to read the word. I'm going to study. I'm going to encourage others, and then just do it. 20 years, you know, the Lord's timing, and uh, so this is awesome. It's like Proverbs 13, 12 says, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is as of the tree of life. Like you're eating off the tree of life. Isn't that amazing? So that's how I feel this morning up here. That's what I thought of yesterday. I wanted to share that with you. So we're continuing the series called the Red Letter Series, okay? How many of you enjoy reading through the home devotionals of the Red Letter Series, right? Those are rich. Love those. Last week, we heard from Christina Hernandez. Didn't she do a fantastic job? Yeah. I was watching that, and I kept saying to myself, boys, I'm just talking to myself, we're in the deep end. She did a really great job. And after listening to the message, I was like, okay, how am I going to follow that? She did so good. So I like to pray the Our Father before my messages. And what a special day today to do that, because guess what? We're in the Red Letter series, and the Our Father prayer in the Bible is in red, because he was answering a question from the disciples, and they said, hey, we want to be like you. How do we pray? And he said, pray like this. So let's pray together as a family. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So I almost feel like, you know, when you're running or do a sports event and Once that gate drops or the gun goes off, you're like, so after the Our Father prayer, I just feel like, let's do this. So I'll be talking today about having a servant's heart, learning from Jesus who did what? He came to serve, not to be served. So the title for today's message is Simon Says. Isn't that a crazy title? So let me decipher this for you. In the game, Simon Says, you have to pay attention to who is telling you what to do, right? If Simon says the command and you do it, you're still in the game. If Simon doesn't say the command and you still do it, then you lose, you're done. So let's try this this morning, okay? Simon says, touch your nose. Simon says, say Tim is cool. Raise your hand. Oh, 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 man. So we got you. How many, how many people we get on the online family? You got to tell them to see here. So just like in the Bible, it's easy to see when Jesus said something with the red letter Bible, right? All the words that Jesus said are in red. It's so nice. If we do what Jesus says, we will win every time. A command that doesn't come from Jesus, for example, the devil will say, you don't need to tithe. You don't need to go to church. You can spend time with the Lord tomorrow. You don't need to forgive. You can keep that grudge. Remember what they said? Remember what they did to you? Okay, guess what? That's not the right voice to listen to, is it? You need to discern the voice you are listening to and react quickly, just like in the Simon Says game. You know, in every situation, I think there's like a one second or less, and I think, raise your hand if you think this is true, that you know in your heart and in your mind what the right response, what the right reaction is to do, but your pride, it gets in the way and it says, justice, I want to right this wrong, right? And it's easier to just keep going the path I'm going than to go and just not say anything, you know what I mean? It's kind of tough or to to build up or encourage where, you know, it would be hard to do that in that situation. So 
I want to tell you a story from the Bible where two grown men should have listened to that voice and reacted earlier and stopped something embarrassing from happening. The two sons of a fisherman named Zebedee were James and John. So Jesus gave these two brothers the nickname Sons of Thunder. What a great nickname, right? So we're going to do something fun today. When I say the Sons of Thunder, I want you to stomp your feet and we're going to make a thundering noise so that we get the impact of the teaching this morning. So, and Simon says, so. <laughs> yeah. Well, Zebedee's wife, we don't know what her name was, but we know that she was an in-charge woman, right? Did you know that she was the first helicopter parent that I could find in history or in the Bible? So the definition of helicopter parenting is this. It's a style of parents who are overly focused on their children. The parent typically takes too much responsibility for their children's experiences and their successes and failures. So here is how she qualifies to be a helicopter parent. Well, the sons of thunder, all right, they approached Jesus and asked him if her two boys, James and John, the sons of thunder, could sit on thrones to the left and the right of Jesus in the kingdom of heaven. Can you believe that? It's crazy. That really happened. So we're going to read about that in Matthew 20, verses 20 through 23. It says, Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons and kneeling down asked a favor of him. What is it you want? He asked. She said, Grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink of the cup I'm going to drink? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those to, for whom they have been prepared by my Father. So I believe the sons of thunder told mom about a conversation that the disciples had with Jesus mentioned in a previous chapter, Matthew 19, verse 28. Let's check that out. Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits in his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel." So Jesus told the disciples that they would sit on 12 thrones in the kingdom of heaven. So the big question for the disciples was, what order were those 12 thrones going to be in? Good question. Well, we don't know if the sons of thunder put their mom up to this, but she played her helicopter parent role, and her sons were standing right there. You know, the motives of their heart was to secure the top two thrones next to Jesus in heaven. They were thinking of themselves. That's our human nature, right? Their mom got them into some heat with the other disciples. They were a little upset. I read in Matthew 20, verse 24, it says, the other 10 followers heard this, and they were angry with the two brothers. <laughs> so James and John, they needed to save some face with the other disciples for sure. So you may think, wow, isn't that shallow? But let me set the stage for you here. Prior to that, all the disciples got into a heated discussion about who among them was the greatest. So Jesus used this opportunity to talk to the disciples about God's economy. Humble or glorified, give and you shall receive, the last will be first, and having a servant's heart. In Matthew 20, 25 through 28, it says, Jesus called them together and he said, you know the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their high officials exercise of authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Unbelievable, right? Jesus in heaven came to earth and became a man so that he could serve and not be served. It's awesome. So what does it look like to be a servant? 
to qualify to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? So that's the question the disciples really wanted answered. In Matthew 18, 1 through 4, it says, At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? So here we go. He called a little child to him and placed the child among them, and he said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly possession of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So what's the bottom line here? How can we apply this to our lives and become like a child? So it's about having a humble heart of a child, a simple trusting faith, and right motives. So my point number one is a humble heart, simple faith, and right motives are key. So I have a story for you to demonstrate right motives. You might get a kick out of this. This was about 20 years ago, and the Lord kind of put on my heart three people in our church that I would be clearing their driveway that next winter, and I was like, if I'm hearing this right, okay, all I have is this junky shovel that's all bent up, and I, it's just, it's not good. It leaves a signature when you, when you shovel because it's like all that bad. I said, you're going to have to get me a snowblower if you want me to do this, if I'm hearing you right. So the next day, my Aunt Mary calls, and she says, Timmy, that's what my family calls me, So, because I'm a second, a junior, and my son is a third, and he just had a fourth. Isn't that amazing? Praise God. So she said, I just moved into a new place, and they got a gravel driveway, and whenever I snow blow the driveway, I'm spitting rocks all over my car. So if you want the snow blower, you can come and get it. So I'm like, yeah, I'll be right over. I went and picked it up, and I'm like, wow, what amazing timing. What a coincidence. No, 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 no. So I did exactly what the Lord did. I said, I went and I did those driveways. I did my driveway, and then I did those other three driveways, and I was never late to work. Isn't that amazing? Because it takes a while. They had some big driveways. So one weekend that winter, we got like a foot of snow. And I did my driveway, I did their driveways, and then I came home about 10 or 11 in the morning, and I said, Lynn, my wife, I said, I'm going to take my son, and we're going to go out, and we're going to take the shovel and the snowblower, we're going to make some money. She goes, what? Are you, are you kidding me? Do you hear yourself right now? And I'm like, what? I'm, I'm being a dad. It's my job. I'm going to teach my son the value of hard work. No, no, no. That, that snowblower was from the Lord to bless people, not to go and make money with. And I, I said, Lynn, I'm the man in the house. I made a decision. That's what we're going to do. She goes, okay. <laughs> so I went out. I took my son. We went, and he shoveled, and I snowblowed. And, and the lady comes outside, and she goes, you know, I don't like where you put the snow. I'm not paying you. She turned around walked inside. I'm like, what? My son goes, is that possible? Can we call the cops? <laughs> I'm like, I don't think so. Let's go to the next place. Well, of course, it was slippery out, and I'm a crazy man in a car, so we're sliding sideways and donuts and having fun. Well, we get a little bit about a block down the road, and I can't even breathe in the car. We spilled a couple gallons of gas in the back of the car. The whole thing was just gas. And so the rest of the day, five degrees weather, I'm out the thing cutting with a knife the carpet out of the car and I'm with a spray hose <gasps> I destroyed the car insurance wouldn't cover it and um, it was a bad deal so it was miserable so I learned a valuable lesson that day listen to your wife. exactly <laughs> One, yeah listen to my wife so I had the right motives to teach my son the value of hard work correct but as my wife said to use the holy grail of snowblowers, not good idea. So my wife was right. If we would have went out and just snowblowed for fun and blessed people, that would have probably taught my son more lessons than listen to some of the things that came out of my mouth that afternoon, right? <laughs> so you see, I'm not perfect. No one is perfect. And we are called to humble ourselves and serve where we can. This doesn't look the same for everyone, Find your niche and your place to serve. Amen. So 
What is the Lord nudging you to do, to serve? Maybe pushing you out of your comfort zone a little bit. So my next point is this. Serving doesn't look the same for everyone. So you ever notice that Jesus, he flips things upside down? Besides the money changing tables, of course. Give and you shall receive. The first will be last and last will be first. The humble will be glorified and those who glorify themselves will be humbled. Save the world by dying on a cross. You know, in that time, the crucifixion or dying on the cross was for the worst criminals. So, yeah, he really changed that up for us. You know, another perfect example of turning something upside down for Jesus was the night before he was betrayed. Jesus wrapped a towel around his waist and he washed his disciples' feet. Isn't that amazing? The, let's read about that in John 13, 2 through 5. It says, The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist, and after that he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. So when Jesus washed his disciples' feet, that was very uncomfortable for the disciples. Even Peter resisted, if you can remember the story there. This was because to wash feet was a low servant's position, even a hired hand or a slave. So what did Jesus do? He gave us an example of how to humble ourselves and love and serve others. In John 13, 34 through 35, I want you to find the common denominator in this scripture. You ready for this? A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So what was the common denominator? Love, love one another. Awesome. And he said, okay, now you go and do the same. So today, how can we go and do the same? This is key because, as you've heard me say before, we are the hands and feet of Jesus on this earth, okay? As we serve, we need to serve out of our overflow. And what I mean is our spiritual overflow. In the past, I've heard people refer to this as paying the power bill. Starla refers to this uh, three weeks ago in her message as her daily rhythm. And I learned how to spell rhythm after that. R-H-Y-T-H-M. Impressed? Uh, don't ask me to spell vacuum. That one's a tough one. So we do this in our daily spiritual disciplines. This includes our quiet time with the Lord, reading and studying the Bible, praying, journaling, worship time, fasting, and listening to the Lord. So what did Jesus do? You know, he oftentimes slipped away and spent time with his father praying for his day, his disciples, and, and even all believers. We see in John, what was that, 27 or 2027, something like that. So I have a theory that if I'm approached midweek to pray for someone for something really important, am I going to feel ready? Am I going to feel qualified to pray? Feel that closeness to the Lord? Have a strong faith to be able to pray with authority? We're putting some daily and weekly spiritual disciplines in place that will draw us close to the Lord and have that word of God in our heart. You know, it's uh, reading the word out loud, one of my favorite disciplines. And that's what I've added to my daily routine since I kind of started studying this. You know, when the storms come, the tests, the trials will come. And it says in Ephesians that after you have done all you can do, you stand. Isn't that amazing? And it's, you know, you're paying that power bill. You know, I understand there's going to be days and there's going to be times when it just doesn't work out for you to spend time with the Lord in the morning. But you want to strive to make this a priority. I heard a saying from Pastor Zach Blickens one time. It says, seven days without reading your Bible makes one week. But he actually spelled the word week, W-E-A-K. 
Isn't that amazing? So recently, my brother, he suggested a book for my wife and I, and it's about spiritual disciplines. My brother has been a Christian for about seven years now, and you should see him teaching his girls about Jesus. So amazing. And sometimes they go, call Uncle Tim when they have a really tough question. So these girls are pretty sharp. They just ask some deep questions. I'm like, hang on, call me back. I got to pray about that one. You know what I mean? So one thing this book discusses is Christian meditation, to listen to the Lord and ask him to speak to you. I have my own style, and I tried the suggestion in the book to listen to quietly for 30 minutes. And honestly, before I even started, I just told my wife, I said, let's just cut that in half. I cannot do 30 minutes. So uh, we did 15 minutes, and then uh, it was tough. It was tough for me, and I realized that I needed to find what worked for me. It's different for everybody. So some of the suggestions in the book were to ponder on scripture, listen to a worship song, or just sit and listen quietly, or go spend time out in in the woods or the nature trail and just looking at God's creation. And the time with the Lord is so important. It's like when we pray, we're talking to God, but when we spend time with the Lord and reading his word, he's talking to us, right? Right? You know, when I first heard the term Christian meditation, I was a bit confused. And the reason was that other religions, the goals with meditation is to empty your mind. But in Christian meditation, the goal is to fill your mind with the word and what the Lord wants to speak to you. So what we're going to do is Jonathan's in the back, and I've asked him to prepare two 30-second segments. So the first 30 seconds... What I want you to do is just give over to the Lord anything that's on your heart that's burdening you, a fear, anxiety, and stress, or anything that's clogging your brain. I want to spend 30 seconds and just, just give it to the Lord. He says, cast your cares on him because he cares for you. So Jonathan, when you're ready, buddy. Awesome. Thank you. And now we're going to take 30 seconds, and we're just going to open up our heart, and we're going to listen to the Lord. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. So let's go 30 more seconds, and we're just going to ask the Lord to speak to us. Sons of thunder. All right, we awake up there. Awesome, thank you. All right, so I want to encourage each and every one of you to find out what works for you. Spend time in God's word and listening to the Lord. It's that simple. So, of course, we've got to find out what works for us. So we've got to try different things. Take a walk on the nature trail, go outside, just go into a quiet room and just listen to the Lord. And... Uh, that's, I'm looking forward to hearing people come up to me and go, hey, I did this and I tried it and it was really awesome. So my third point is this. Your time with the Lord is your fuel. And it doesn't cost $4 a gallon. It's free. Okay? So, and it's different for everybody. So when we seek first the kingdom of God, remember that's my brother-in-law Darren's scripture every day, and his righteousness, then there is a promise that we will receive all we need for that day. And this will give us strength and peace to love and serve others, which leads me to the next step in loving and serving. So serving is something 
it's sometimes birthed uh, from our past, our desire and where we want to serve and what we've gone through and what we've experienced. So I have a story with you that I, I can't promise that I'm going to stay just all together here because this is a tough one. But it's, it's, cha- <laughs> it's changed my life. When I was about 10, my folks got divorced and my siblings were all moved to Michigan. And my mom, she worked hard all day and then she went to school at night for several years and we didn't have hardly anything and it was very tough to make ends meet. My mom, she had a AMC Gremlin. It was a car, it was a junker. And it was in sad shape. And winter was coming up and everything that could go wrong with that car was going wrong. The muffler was dragging, the tires were slicks, the headlights were, you know, some didn't work, the blinkers didn't work, the body damage, and the heat didn't work. So one Friday afternoon, these guys from the church showed up, and they got my mom's car, and then gave us a loaner for the weekend. And I thought, well, they're going to change the oil or something, or, well, that's nice. Well, they came back Sunday afternoon, honked the horn, and we all went outside, and I look at my mom, and she's just weeping and dropped to her knees, and I look, and the car is completely restored. We walk around, and it's got new tires, the body work's all good, muffler's all shiny out the back, you know how it is for the first couple weeks, you have it? The lights work, they're showing my mom the blinkers and the heat, and it was just... Hallelujah. <sighs> That changed my life. And uh, I have a heart for single moms that, it, that will never die, okay? And uh, I don't know, sorry. Uh, when I practiced it, I never got that choked up, so sorry. But when the Lord matches your heart's motivation with the need and you're serving from a place of your spiritual overflow, It doesn't matter if all you have is a little bit. The Lord will meet you. You and the Holy Spirit and the Lord equals infinity. Okay? So, again, how can we go and do the same? You know, I may sound like a broken record here, but this is key. We listen to that still, small voice, that nudge from the Holy Spirit, and then follow through on what you feel you are hearing. Pray to the Lord, tell him you're willing, and he will bring an opportunity for you to serve. So what I do, what you do, is what Jesus says in his words, that like him, we are to serve and not to be served. You know, in life, we have a ton on our plate, our relationships with the Lord, our family, our church, our work, our hobbies. All these things are coming at us at different levels every day. Well, I like object lessons, and I have this Object lesson here, it's over here, let me grab it. I didn't want to put it behind that and it squealed really loud, so I had to go way over there. So this represents different things in my life that are going on right now. I have my family, I have my church and my ministry, I have my friends and my hobbies, and I have my work, and I have my dad. Why would my dad be way over here? I'm like mid-50s, and why do I have my dad as a priority in my life? Well, it would be cool if I could just balance everything perfect, right? And just say, okay, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%. But it's not, it's not like that. I can't just balance everything perfect. Right now, my dad's got, been diagnosed with dementia and Parkinson's. And so I go over there and I sleep overnight one night a week and tell my mom at 8 o'clock, oh, you go downstairs, you go to sleep. I got dad all night. I'll get him up. I'll take care of him. And, and then I work the next day. So she gets a whole night's sleep which she never, she gets like three hours of sleep, she says. So this is really important for me to do that and serve my mom and my dad. So notice that I got to move my shift, my priorities over because of that pressure from my dad. And guess what? That's taken away from my work sometimes a little bit. It takes away from my my hobbies, my family, my church time. But that's a priority right now. And that's what I'm doing. But, oh, here we go. I got my work over here. Every five weeks I'm on call. I get about three or four hours of sleep myself that time. I get a calls all night. And it's, it's terrible. I hate it. But that's part of my job, and I got to do it. So um, that takes away from ministry. It takes away from my family. It takes away from my hobbies. And then this one in the middle was friends and hobbies, right? Well, 
About three years ago, a friend of mine got diagnosed with cancer. They had three months to live. Well, I told myself, I'm not just going to say, I'll pray for you. I went over to his house every day for 45 minutes to an hour and just sat with him. We talked, we prayed, we laughed, and we watched race videos because we used to race together. And, and uh, I served him and his family, and then I was even able to do the, the funeral. But it was, it was an investment that took away from my work, took away from my family, took away from church and ministry time. But it was a priority the Lord put on my heart at that time. So you'll notice that you just can't put equal pressure for everything. And you got to kind of follow your heart and what the Lord's put on your heart to do. And then follow that, okay? So life can be difficult at times, right? The pressures and full schedules, the calendar fills up quickly. It's hard to balance that. When I look at my wife's little calendar book, it's only about that big, but it's just a scribble. If you look back in months before, it's, I'm like, how can you read anything on there? Right? We get pretty busy. So speaking of remembering, I want to share something with you. In our home, we have made a word that only we know about, but I'm going to share it with you, so now my whole church family will know about it as well. So it starts off like this. Who's ever ordered something, and then it shows up on your doorstep, and you're looking at it when you drive in the driveway, you're like, what did I order? I can't remember. So this happens to me all the time. Not that I order that much, but um, I, I, I grab a knife and I open it up and I look at it and I'm like, oh my gosh, a can opener, a bike for my part, a part for my bike. How could I forget that? But the, we've thought this word, it's uh, Amazonnesia. So I took Amazon and amnesia and I kind of pressed them together. So it's Amazonnesia. So it's when you kind of order, you forget what you ordered. So, so the, the sad thing is, I can remember the bad things I've done my whole life, like a broken record, okay? But most days, I can't remember what I had for lunch the day before. And honestly, yesterday when I was eating dinner, I asked my wife what we had for lunch that day. I was like, what is wrong with me? So the point is, the enemy, his job is to keep you down and doubt yourself and your gifts and your talents. He doesn't want you to remember the good and the difference that you've made or that you could make. Yes, sometimes when you serve, you may not feel valued or appreciated. You may even have been offended in the past or you feel that you did a bad job or you didn't make a difference. So I'm gonna get real here. Part of this is gut training. The Lord is shaping us like clay, right? We're all at work in progress till the day we die. He's toughening us up, testing us, our stand and our motivation. This is all part of the growing process, our sanctification, our spiritual maturity. We need to trust it and hang in there. And know we're loved, know we're appreciated, and know we're valued. You are wired to serve in a capacity that's just right for you. You are made for community, and we need one another. When you find that area to serve in, it it fuels you. You know, you need to know that you have a purpose, a calling, gifts, and talents that we've talked about before to serve the Lord and make a difference in your world, your neighborhood, your family, your work. You know, at times we may feel we have nothing to offer. We may feel we're in an off season or just checking the boxes of life. You know, I've found that when we take the first step and the Holy Spirit will meet you right there and it will multiply it and give you the strength and the joy and the peace that you need to serve. You know, in John 14, 12, it says, very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. Is that amazing promise? You know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just kind of be real with you again here. My wife asked me a couple months ago, she goes, what's your biggest dream? I, I didn't even think about it. I just said, I want to preach to a 1,000 people. She just almost started crying. She goes, wow, amazing. You know, it's like, yeah, well, I didn't even know that was going to come out until you asked me. And, um, and it's like, how can we do even greater things than Jesus walking the earth? And whenever I read that scripture, you know what I think of? 3,001. You know why? The day of Pentecost, how many people? It said over 3,000, but I was just to say 3,000. 
if I were to preach in a stadium with 10,000 people and 3,000 people came to the Lord, 3,001, I would be like, I have done greater things. Now, not in pride. I'm not trying to be that guy. I'm not trying to be prideful. But I'm just saying, my brain is, it thinks big. And those of you who know me know that. But I'm just saying, that's the kind of things that drive me. Get me out of bed in the morning. Study the word. Cross-reference. Flipper cards, right? It's like, I am going to be God's ambassador and listen to his, that still small voice. I'm going to go, and I'm going to be, and I'm going to do. And that's what you guys need to do as well. I mean, a lot of you are doing it. But I'm just saying, that's, it's the simple things. Every day, one step in front of the other. I can't remember what song that, what was that from? Uh, uh, Wizard of Oz? Rudolph, Rudolph, thank you. Yeah, awesome, thank you. So I believe that... Um, with faith and trust in the Lord and stepping out and serving with the Holy Spirit in you, the Holy Spirit is charged to move mountains, right? And it'll give you life as you live and you serve the Lord. Remember that spiritual disciplines is important, simple faith, humility, loving people, and listening to that still small voice, and you will win every time. So we need to keep the faith, fight the fight, and run our race. And Simon says to say amen loudly. Amen. Yes, amen. Well, family, let me pray for you. So, Lord, we thank you for the honor and the privilege of sharing with my church family your word that you put on my heart. Lord, we pray that as we are, are reading your word, and even at home with this Red Litter series up until June, that you would be encouraging us, strengthening us, and increasing our faith. Help us to be bold and courageous, to share your word, to share our testimony with people, that we, hear, we would hear that still, small voice. We'd be encouraged, and we'd be filled up and fueled to serve, to love, and, uh, Lord, put people on our hearts, and then when we get that direction, that we would pray and say, we're willing, what do you want me to do? And that we would go and do it. And if we fail or we succeed, doesn't matter. We're following the Lord. Lord, we're planting seeds. And we thank you, God. And we pray as well for our spiritual disciplines, our quiet times, that people would find out what works for them. And they would be drawn to you and you would draw near to them. We thank you, God. So church family, raise your hands for this pastoral blessings. Lord, you say that the Lord would bless you and keep you. May his face shine towards you and be gracious to you, that the Lord would turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. Thank you, God.